Until a few weeks ago, most in the West had probably never had much reason to discuss the nation of Guyana. In recent years, global attention has been locked on the war in Ukraine, conflicts between Azerbaijan and Armenia, escalations in the Middle East, the conflict in Myanmar, and a dozen other flashpoints besides. Under those circumstances, it's kind of understandable that a small South American nation of approximately 800,000 people might pass somewhat below the media radar. Until earlier this month, when the ruler of Venezuela, Nicolas Maduro, declared there would be a public referendum endorsing, among other things, the incorporation of the territory of Essequibo, making up roughly two-thirds of the nation of Guyana, into Venezuela as a new state. Unsurprisingly, this totally legitimate and fair referendum, in which the people of Essequibo did not participate, delivered 95% support for Maduro's position. And equally unsurprisingly, the government of Guyana were not exactly amused. Now, at first glance, this might seem like an interesting strategic decision for a country currently experiencing more than 300% annual inflation, and whose recent military achievements include losing an armed warship by accidentally ramming a civilian cruise liner. But with neighbouring Guyana's military being relatively small, the country discovering significant oil and gas reserves, and Maduro's domestic approval ratings reportedly being far underwater, some are asking whether or not Maduro will actually throw the dice on a special military operation of his own, and if so, how a return to interstate warfare in South America might impact the countries involved. So today I'm going to try and unpick the recent escalation and ask a couple of key questions. Firstly, how I'll have a look at some of the recent history of both Venezuela and Guyana, and ask how the dispute over Essequibo has evolved over the last several centuries. Then I'll have a look at the military forces available to both Venezuela and Guyana, and ask what sort of military options Venezuela might have available to it if it chooses to take this beyond simple posturing. Then I'll have a look at where some major regional actors fit into all of this. You know, major players like Brazil, the United States, China, or ExxonMobil. Then finally, we'll put it all together and look at some of the practicalities and risks associated with any Venezuelan escalation, including such highlights as why pushing an army through the Amazonian rainforest with limited infrastructure is probably a bad idea, why any military escalation would be incredibly risky for Venezuela, and why, despite starting a war arguably being a very stupid thing to do, there may be a small but non-zero chance that Maduro decides to pull a Galtieri manoeuvre and try it anyway. A small apology in advance to say that I have caught COVID again, and am fighting through it as I record this, so please do bear with me. So let's start, as we often do, with the history of one of the main characters of this particular story, the nation of Venezuela and specifically, how it helped lead to the current crisis. Venezuela is a South American nation of approximately 28 million people, a fall from a previous high north of 30 million, that borders Guyana to the east, Brazil to the south, Colombia to the west, and the Atlantic to the north. At times in the past, the nation was one of the richest in South America, but these days it's considerably poorer on a per capita basis than any of its immediate neighbours. The most recent IMF estimates are that the country has a GDP of about 92 billion US dollars or 211 billion in purchasing power parity terms, giving a nominal GDP per capita of about $3,500 per person, all while the country is dealing with a casual 360% annual inflation rate. The territory that now makes up Venezuela has a long indigenous history, but its territorial claims mostly derive from the Spanish colonial period and the wars of independence in the 19th century. For more than a decade in the early 19th century, Venezuela's experience of independence from Spain was as a province of a larger country. This was Gran Colombia under its president and hero of the wars of independence, Simón Bolívar. In 1831, however, Gran Colombia would dissolve into its constituent components, and Venezuela would become, from that point on, an independent state. To describe the political history of Venezuela from that point forward as complex would probably be an understatement. There were periods of de facto dictatorship under figures like Juan Gomez, who effectively ruled the country between 1908 and 1935. The mid and late Cold War saw a movement towards democracy, with figures like President Betancourt and later President Rafael Caldera. Today, the country is run by Nicolas Maduro. He took over after the death of former President Hugo Chavez in 2013, though his right to hold that position has been disputed on a number of occasions most notably following the disputed results of the May 2018 elections, which at its peak led to about 60 nations recognising the head of the Venezuelan National Assembly, Juan Guaido, as president of Venezuela rather than Nicolas Maduro. But despite those controversies and reportedly deep domestic unpopularity, Maduro is still the man running the show in Venezuela in 2023, and the country he leads has no shortage of natural resources. In particular, Venezuela has oil, so much oil. 
By some measures, Venezuela sits on the world's largest proven oil reserves, and it's been a major oil producer for about a century at this point. In terms of proven reserves, Venezuela is believed to have about 300 billion barrels of oil, putting it ahead even of Saudi Arabia. Historically, this immense oil wealth has been both a blessing and a curse for the Venezuelan nation. It's often been a major driver for economic growth and a way to get significant foreign capital into the country. But at the same time, it's also exposed the country to Dutch disease, where an economy becomes overly reliant on a single export, often left the country vulnerable to major fluctuations in the international oil price, as well as stunning opportunities for alleged mismanagement and corruption. Historically speaking, for Venezuela's leaders, the oil industry has often been a sort of political crutch, providing the economic bankroll necessary to maintain support and power. But if you're Maduro in 2023, you have a number of problems, starting with the oil sector. Despite sitting on immense oil resources, over the last decade, Venezuela's oil production has collapsed from its previous highs, inflation has taken hold, and what was previously one of the wealthier countries in South America has dramatically fallen from economic grace. In 2012, the country had a nominal GDP of 383 billion US dollars, about 12.7 thousand US dollars per person. Just over a decade later, the new figure was 92 billion US dollars, about 3.5 thousand per person. Switching over to purchasing power parity makes the situation look slightly better, with the new fall being from 545 billion to 212 billion. But inflation, which peaked at about 60,000% in 2018, is still north of 300%. And inflation got so bad that back in 2021, the country had to roll out its 1 million Bolivar note, worth about 50 US cents at the time. In short, Venezuela is a country which has fallen significantly from economic grace. It's blessed with a massive supply of natural resources in high demand around the world, but economically, the oil sector is in desperate need of recapitalization, as well as relief from international sanctions, sanctions which escalated significantly after the disputed 2018 election. As recently as October, it looked like that relief was very much coming. Sanctions were easing and money flowing into the Venezuelan oil sector as part of an agreement between Maduro's government and the Americans. Maduro agreed to allow free and fair elections in 2024 in exchange for significant sanctions relief. It was a significant development that was already having an impact on Venezuelan oil production. But it also gives some interesting context to Maduro's decision to escalate the dispute with his neighbor. But we'll come back to that when we get to the Essequibo dispute itself. So that's Venezuela, let's talk about the other key protagonist in this story, Guyana. And while the region has obviously been populated by indigenous people for thousands of years, the territorial dispute with Venezuela has its roots in the colonial era, so that's where we're going to start. Because there is nothing that narrators of global history love more than recycling storylines. And who doesn't love a repeat of the old classic, colonial power draws line on map, only for those lines to then cause problems further down the road. Guyana's modern borders have their root in British and Dutch colonial history, most notably the former state of British Guyana. The country's linguistic and ethnic makeup also reflect that history. The country's official language is English. The largest ethnic groupings alongside indigenous people are those of African or Indian descent, reflecting the historical movement of often enslaved or indentured populations to help drive a colonial economy that was for many decades based primarily on things like sugarcane production and mining. You can see a period map there on the right with its borders marked, Venezuela on the left, Dutch Guyana on the right, and Brazil to the south. And running through that territory is the Great Essequibo River. To help make it more visible on the map there, I've highlighted part of the river's path using my top-tier art skills. That great river flows into the Atlantic, and it's very much going to be a main character in this story going forward, so remember it's there. Guyana gained independence in 1966. Importantly for the country, there was no devastating war of independence. Instead, the transition to power was peaceful, and while the country became a republic in 1970, it chose to remain, and remains to this day, a member of the Commonwealth of Nations. In geopolitical and economic terms, there was good news and bad news for Guyana in the years post-independence. The good news was that while the country's borders were still being challenged, particularly by Venezuela, its administrative control of its territory wasn't militarily challenged or anything of that nature, and so the newly independent Guyana largely maintained control of the old British territory. The bad news, however, was that the economy of the newly independent state was very weak. For most of its post-independence period, the country was one of the poorer South American states. The country repeatedly ran up significant international debt and required international debt relief, which it continued to qualify for as a relatively poor state, even into the early 2000s. In a way, you can argue Guyana managed to avoid many of the worst fates that often afflict post-colonial countries. There have been political scandals and contested elections, 
but the country did reach the 21st century as a democracy that has seen and experienced peaceful transitions of power. Periods of economic crisis did drive waves of emigration, but the country itself held together. And for the most part, the country managed to avoid engagement in significant interstate or even civil wars, with those incidents that did take place usually happening on a relatively small scale. For example, a three-day armed uprising by essentially a group of cattle ranchers in the 1960s, in which perhaps a grand total of 10 people were killed. You could argue the only missing part to a successful post-colonial story was major economic growth. Or at least you could say that until just a few years ago, when international oil companies began to discover that Guyana, much like its neighbour Venezuela, might just be sitting on what is described in the industry as a metric shit tonne of hydrocarbon resources. Major international players saw an opportunity to invest in oil production in a country which is not a member of OPEC and had decent or very good international relations with a wide array of countries. That was a pretty attractive economic and geopolitical proposition, and so the money started flowing in. Now, there will be some people listening, I'm thinking of Australians, Norwegians, and similar, who might understand at least a little bit what a resource boom can look like for an economy. But even those comparisons miss the incredible scale of what is happening in Guyana because the benefits of the significant oil resources that are being discovered are spread across a relatively small population of only around 800,000 people. And so the yield and effect on a per capita basis has been truly incredible. But hey, this channel likes to deal in numbers, so let's give you some numbers. In 2012, the GDP of the entire country was 4.1 billion US dollars, about 5,500 per person. In 2020, it had only grown to 5.5 billion dollars, or about 7,000 dollars per person, but only three years later, Guyana was arguably the fastest growing country on planet Earth, with a new GDP of $16.3 billion, or 20,500 US dollars per person. That's already pretty bonkers, but it's even more insane when you look at it in purchasing power parity terms. In 2020, GDP on a purchasing power parity basis was $15.5 billion, almost $20,000 per person, and in 2023, it had risen to $48.5 billion, or more than 60,000 US dollars per person. Non-oil sectors of the economy, like construction, manufacturing, even parts of the agricultural sector, were also showing growth, which is important if you're trying to avoid Dutch disease, which is the problem mismanaged resource-based economies can have if all resources are sucked into the resource sector and everything else fades away as a result. And while unemployment levels are still in the double digits, they are coming down by several percentage points per year. In other words, at a time when most of the rest of the world is struggling in economic terms, Guyana is going to the moon faster than bloody NASA. And with so much work still to do in terms of oil exploration and extraction, most international organisations are predicting the growth will continue for some years yet, with the IMF projecting a casual 45% real GDP growth in 2024. If you're trying to put that into a personal perspective, just imagine your income roughly doubling every two years, and then apply that logic to an entire national economy. In a sense, the entire country has basically won the resource lottery. And like winning the lottery, admittedly, a lot can go wrong. A lot of countries in the past have badly managed resource booms and as a result ended up in a worse position than when they started. Others, cough Norway cough, have been more able to effectively channel them to the great benefit of the society. Which path Guyana's story ultimately takes remains to be seen but the country has been given a chance that not every nation gets. And assuming nothing bad happens, like for example a neighbouring state coming in and trying to seize all of those oil resources, Guyana's days as a poor country may soon be behind it. There are some notes to add here about Guyana's geopolitical positioning. As a small nation, it's historically pulled largely from the small nation defence strategy playbook. Namely, they've tried to avoid having any significant enemies while having as many powerful friends as possible. Guyana has friendly relations, including military exchanges with a range of countries, including France, the United States, Brazil, China, India, the United Kingdom, and Canada. Its army conducts military exercises with the United States. Many of its officers train in British military institutions, and I believe some of its military pilots may have done air combat qualification work with China. One note is that I haven't seen Guyana describe Venezuela's ally Russia as a major partner, while another is that Guyana doesn't have a full mutual defense treaty with any of its partners. It has the right to appeal to its friends for assistance in a crisis, but unlike, for example, the Philippines or the various members of NATO, it doesn't have a relevant treaty structure or obligation that it can call in. What it does arguably have, however, are some very powerful nations with some reason to be invested in its success. I've often seen it reported that ExxonMobil is the dominant player in Guyana's oil production, which is true. 
The roughly 400,000 barrels of oil per day flow from offshore oil fields, currently operated by a consortium of major oil companies. Those are ExxonMobil, which has a 45% stake, Hess, which owns 30%, and a 25% stake belonging to the state-owned China National Offshore Oil Corporation, meaning that for all the geopolitical competition and confrontation around the world, when it comes to oil production in Guyana, American companies and Chinese state-owned enterprises have been able to sit down, shake hands, and agree that they're in this together. That already gives you some pretty big players with skin in the game, and as we'll come back to later, other countries and corporations might be looking to get involved as well. So with that introduction to the various players out of the way, let's talk about Essequibo, Venezuela's claims, and the current potential path towards escalation. So remember the Essequibo River we marked on that map earlier? Well, for its entire existence, based on claims going all the way back to the Spanish colonial era, Venezuela has claimed that everything west of that river is rightfully part of Venezuela. To put that in perspective, that's a region of roughly 160,000 square kilometres, commonly compared to Greece in terms of total size, and comprises a majority of Guyana's current territory, even if it's home to less than a quarter of the population. Much of the region is dominated essentially by Amazonian rainforest. Dense forest does not lend itself to the construction of border markers or fences, especially in the early colonial era, and so at this point the border has been disputed on and off for centuries. Now I obviously have to give an overview of the dispute here, but I want to stress this is very high level, and I acknowledge for the people of the region these issues are going to be highly emotive. As I said, for its entire existence, Venezuela has claimed the territory of Guyana up to the Essequibo River, whereas British and then independent Guyana has claimed and administered it. In 1899, there was an agreement to take the dispute to international arbitration, although to say there was a decision might be missing some of the nuance there. America's Monroe Doctrine at the time basically said no European power should be meddling in the Americas because that was the US's patch and the US would apply significant pressure on Britain to submit the dispute between Britain and Venezuela to international arbitration. Britain eventually agreed, as did Venezuela. That arbitration largely sided with the British and gave us the current de facto borders, which are also the ones that are generally speaking the most internationally recognised. Venezuela did originally ratify the 1899 award, but would withdraw recognition of it in the 1960s. That essentially reopened the dispute and led to a new agreement in 1966. That agreement is discussed a lot, and I've seen lots of different claims as to what it actually says. I would recommend going and reading the document. It is only four pages, including the cover. What it expressly didn't do was reverse or abrogate any existing claims. Article 5 of the document was pretty clear on that point. It also made clear that as long as that agreement was in place, no action taken by any party would serve as a basis for, quote, asserting, supporting, or denying a claim to territorial sovereignty unless those activities were the result of an agreement in writing between the government of Guyana and the government of Venezuela. So basically, invasions were meant to be out as an option unless you could secure a written agreement from the other side in order to launch one. What was meant to happen was a staged negotiation process. Firstly, a dual nation mixed commission would discuss the issue and try and reach an agreement. If the commission couldn't reach an agreement within four years, it was meant to file a report and then the respective governments were meant to then agree on a peaceful means of resolving the dispute in line with Article 33 of the UN Charter. If the countries couldn't agree even on what method they wanted to use to negotiate an end to the dispute, then the issue would be pushed to the UN Secretary General. And then, if even that didn't achieve a resolution, then, quote, the Secretary General of the United Nations shall choose another of the means stipulated in Article 33 of the Charter of the United Nations and so on until the controversy has been resolved or until all means of peaceful settlement there contemplated have been exhausted. People being people, there was obviously no agreement, and so the issue went to the UN Secretary General. Decades of mediation and back and forth work followed. There was still no agreement, so in 2016, the Secretary General basically said, look guys, sort this out, or I'm going to throw the issue to the International Court of Justice. The ICJ is an arm of the United Nations, and it arbitrates disputes between countries. There was still no agreement at the point, so the issue got sent to the ICJ. Had nothing else changed, several years down the track, we would have gotten a decision. In the interim, the ICJ issued a binding order to Venezuela not to take any action which might change the status quo in Essequibo. It was an instruction President Maduro obviously ignored, perhaps in part on the understanding that if you take an issue to court, there is a chance that you lose. And so earlier this month, in defiance of an instruction from the ICJ, Venezuela held a referendum. It purported to ask voters five yes-no questions, including whether or not they supported rejecting the jurisdiction of the ICJ in this case, 
something otherwise known as the sovereign citizen manoeuvre, and whether they supported the government integrating Essequibo as a state of Venezuela. Now, wherever you stand on this particular dispute, it is worth noting that this isn't really how international law works. You don't get to hold a vote in your country in order to vote that part of another country becomes part of yours. But domestically, it purported at least to give the government a mandate. The government announced that it had 95% support for incorporating the region, although it should be noted there are a lot of reports across the media of very low turnout levels, and the results potentially not being accurately represented. Shock horror. The referendum was technically non-binding on the government, meaning that Maduro can still choose to do more or less whatever he wants. But following through on all five points would essentially mean stepping away from the mechanism agreed in 1966 and sparking a significant diplomatic and potentially military escalation. A fair question in all of this, however, might be, why now? These disputes date back to the mid-1800s. The original agreement was at the end of the 19th century, and the 1966 agreement had been recognised by both sides for more than half a century at this point. And it's at this point a cynic might observe, many of those oil resources that have been discovered in Guyana, you know, the ones that are massively rewriting the economic fortunes of the country month on month, year on year, well, a lot of those only fall within Guyana's offshore exclusive economic zone because it controls Essequibo. And so if Essequibo, part of Guyana, was to become Guyana Essequiba, part of Venezuela, Guyana's oil would suddenly be Venezuela's. And again, a cynic might note that that would be a significant boost for Venezuela's oil production, given that output from Venezuela's once extremely lucrative oil sector has fallen from consistently more than 2.5 million barrels per day as recently as 2015, to fewer than 400,000 barrels a day in the July of 2022, and about 760,000 barrels per day as of September 2023. This is basically the it's all about the oil stupid thesis for why Venezuela is choosing to go this route now. And to be sure, Guyana's oil sector is expected to go through meteoric growth in the coming years. In 2019, the country produced exactly zero barrels of oil per day. This year, the number increased to about 400,000, and by the end of next year, it's estimated to reach 600,000. A goal of reaching a million barrels per day this decade is not at all out of the question. The problem is, if Venezuela managed to, for example, seize all of this oil infrastructure by force, it's not clear exactly why they wouldn't end up in the same situation they've gone into with their own existing oil infrastructure. Venezuela has no shortage of viable oil deposits, but alleged mismanagement, corruption, sanctions, and a lack of foreign capital have all left it much diminished and underproductive. And so I think it's fair to say there are multiple interpretations for what might be going on here, what the motivations in Caracas might be. For example, let's just say you're Maduro. You clearly have a couple of problems. The economy is awful, oil production is weak, your country is ranked 177th out of 180 on the Corruption Perception Index, and in order to help solve those economic and oil production issues, you've negotiated a partial end to sanctions. But you've done so by promising to have free and fair elections next year, which is a major problem, because for reasons that may be related to the corruption and the economy burning down, you're also incredibly unpopular. Now, obviously, getting reliable polling data out of Venezuela is always going to be difficult, but some of the polls I was able to find suggested approval ratings in the low 20s and disapproval pushing towards 70. One 2022 poll suggested Maduro might actually only have a 5% approval rating, which for my UK friends is worse than Liz Truss at the end of her tenure. So apart from any geopolitical considerations, Maduro may also be worried about how to hang on to power. Coming at that problem from a first principles perspective, there are different ways he could choose to approach it. He could try to win with a change in policy and good old-fashioned campaigning, but he's pretty far underwater, so that might be a major ask. He could also just go back on the whole democratic process thing, but that runs a series of risks, including snapback sanctions, and also the fact that, in the end, Venezuela isn't North Korea. An even harsher, more authoritarian turn probably wouldn't be without risk. Alternatively, it's just possible that an unpopular leader seeking to distract the population from issues at home may, based on historical precedent, choose to try and distract the population by starting a quick and victorious war to reclaim a territory that they popularly consider to be their own. This is something I'm going to refer to as the Galtieri Maneuver, and it obviously never, ever goes wrong. And even if you don't want an actual war, maybe just a crisis and appeal to patriotism is all you need. Take all those factors into account, and you can see an incentive to escalate. The elections are meant to be next year, so there's an incentive to go now. The ICJ would eventually rule, so there's an incentive to go before it does. And at the rate that Guyana's oil sector is developing... If he waits too long, Maduro may not be dealing with a relatively poor, relatively weak neighbour, 
but rather a rapidly growing one with significant foreign assets in play. Now, as I'll stress again and again, there's no requirement for this situation to escalate to the point of military coercion. But if it does get to that point, one of the key cards in Maduro's hand is going to be the armed forces of Venezuela, more properly described as the National Bolivarian Armed Forces of Venezuela. So let's go over them, assess their numbers and equipment, and ask what they might be capable of in a crisis. Through the late Cold War and immediate post-Cold War period, the Venezuelan military could be described as a relatively reasonably sized regional force. The United States was Venezuela's greatest trading partner, and a lot of the military equipment came either from Europe or the United States. The Navy, for example, was able to order six relatively advanced Italian frigates of the Lupo class in the late 1970s. Those ships were already relatively capable for their day, but two ships of the class would go through further modernization starting in 1998, with modifications being done in an American yard, including the fitting of new German diesel engines, Israeli radars, combat management systems, and ECM, and a new American sonar system. However, support and funding for some of these Western platforms would become more complicated during the Chavez and Maduro years. Under Chavez, things start to change considerably for the military. Total spending on the military increases as more oil revenue is allocated, but force design and armed suppliers both change considerably. Chavez creates new paramilitary and militia forces which bulk out overall manpower, but which appear to be largely equipped for internal security and light duties. We also see the emergence of Russia, and to a lesser extent China, as major armed suppliers. But the key thing to remember here is that while Chavez's rhetoric is much more anti-American than those who came before him, Venezuela in this era isn't under anything like these sanctions that come later in the Maduro era. And so you still see some Western design products, like Spanish design ships or German diesel engines, arriving in Venezuela even during the Chavez years. The US even remains a significant bilateral trading partner. And so under Chavez, the military is able to realize some degree of re-equipment with both new Russian and Western equipment. There are obviously significant issues in some places, but it doesn't all fall apart. Then Maduro happened. And during his rule, Venezuela got to experience highlights like 60,000% annual inflation, the imposition of harsh sanctions by many countries around the world following a disputed election, and with it, a partial breakdown in Venezuela's ability to procure and maintain Western military equipment. That had more than a few impacts on readiness, but let's talk about the overall force first. The army is the largest part of the regular military, and as a result, probably one of the most relevant if the current crisis were to escalate. The 2022 estimate was the army was about 63,000 strong, with a significant base of heavy equipment. And going down that list of heavy equipment reveals the transitional nature of the army's equipment park, and the kind of 50-50 split in many categories between Western and Russian military equipment. For example, there are about 170 main battle tanks and roughly 110 light tanks of four different types. 92 Russian T-72B1s, 80 French AMX-30Vs, and a mixture of even older French AMX-13 and British Scorpion light tanks. The IFV park of about 230 vehicles is more modern, split between BMP-3s and BTR-80As. But the artillery park is back to being confused again, with 24 Grads, 12 Smerch, and 20 Israeli Light Artillery Rocket 160 systems. Meanwhile, helicopters are obviously very useful when dealing with harsh terrain, and so the Venezuelans have a lavish attack helicopter complement of about 9 Mi-35s from Russia. Now, Venezuela also has a force of Marines, roughly 15,000 strong, and of course, the Army's BMP-3 IFV is fully amphibious which is why the Marines bought a bunch of different Chinese vehicles instead. Presumably so particularly sadistic, Marine and Army riflemen can get together and derive great joy from the pain being felt by the various maintainers. The key takeaway here is there's enough equipment and personnel on paper to do a small-scale amphibious operation. But the emphasis here is on small scale. Occupy a beachhead, maybe. Occupy a nation, probably not. Of course, under most circumstances, the Marines will have difficulty getting to a battle zone if you don't have a decent navy. This is also important to Venezuela because a lot of the oil facilities are going to be offshore, and Venezuela in turn is very reliant on getting its exports to the international market in order to maintain the economy it has. On paper, Venezuela does have a navy, but dig a little deeper and there are some limitations. The force is approximately 22,000 personnel, including conscripts, and the most capable combat units of that force on paper are a pair of German-built submarines and European-built frigates. I say on paper because, as we'll get to later, it's kind of hard to be an effective combat unit if your ship or submarine doesn't go. And unfortunately for the Venezuelan Navy, there are a lot of questions about a lot of its assets in that regard. 
What is likely to be dangerous, however, and very likely operational, are the smaller ships, the patrol and coastal combatants and the missile boats. Venezuela has long had, for example, a small force, I believe six units, of old British-designed gunboats equipped with Italian anti-ship missiles. This year, many sources assert they received at least four additional missile boats, this time from Iran. And while none of this exactly makes a premier battle force, they could be a significant threat to oil rigs or civilian vessels or anything that Guyana's navy can field. An American carrier battle group is probably not going to worry about a couple of incoming anti-ship missiles. But for some strange reason, major oil companies have not yet gotten to the point of installing SeaWiz systems on their oil rigs. This is obviously a massive missed opportunity, because I imagine it would be a great way to fight boredom on those sort of platforms if you allowed the crews to occasionally watch a game of SeaWiz skeet shooting. Another giant unknown when assessing the Venezuelan Navy is the quality of training. It's obviously not wise to draw too much of a conclusion from a single incident, but just to give an example here, back in 2020, the Venezuelan Navy won the distinction of losing a warship to an unarmed civilian cruise vessel in international waters. What reportedly happened is the Venezuelan warship encountered the Portuguese flagship Resolute in international waters, demanded it change direction and fired warning shots, and when it was ignored, attempted to board the Resolute, only to accidentally turn into its path instead, get rammed by the Resolute, and because the Resolute has a hardened bow for sailing through icy waters, physics kicked in and lightweight warship ended up sinking while the cruise ship was basically undamaged. Now again, shit can happen when you're operating a navy. In 2021, the US managed to ram a Seawolf-class submarine straight into an undersea mountain. It got back home under its own power and no one died, but it wasn't exactly the navy's finest hour. The issue is, the US navy is huge, the Venezuelan navy isn't, so there isn't really much room to go sacrificing platforms on the altar of human error. Then, as you might observe is often the case with governments like this one, there are a wide array of militias, paramilitaries, and internal security units. The National Guard is relatively small, about 23,000 strong, with a couple of dozen APCs, mixture of Russian and Italian equipment, and some transport slash utility helicopters to provide a limited degree of mobility. There is also a much larger militia force, although how much larger is debated between sources. Military balance estimates about 220,000, so that's the number we're going to go with here. It should be noted, however, that back in 2020, Maduro claimed that there were 3.7 million members of the Venezuelan militia. That would mean about 14% of the entire population of Venezuela, men, women, and children, being in the militia, and their duties have included running checkpoints, providing security at government offices, hospitals, metro stations, turning up at government rallies, and assisting in agriculture. It's admittedly a lot of manpower, but probably not a relevant force if you're talking about moving in and fighting a war in a jungle environment. There's basically nothing in terms of organic fires, vehicles, and even when it comes to firearms, uh, these are the blokes we've often seen break out the good old Mosin Nagants. And unlike the pro-Russia units in the Donbass who often broke out the Mosins, these ones don't appear to have telescopic sights. So while this is a significant pool of additional manpower, any deployment of militia units would need to be supported by the logistics embedded in some other part of the military or co-opted from civilian service. Then there's the Venezuelan Air Force, with the Air Force having the notable advantage of being able to fly over jungle terrain rather than having to move through it. If you watched my episode on the Iranian Air Force, uh, you might get a little bit of deja vu as we go through this, because the Venezuelan Air Force is a mixture of two distinct sets of equipment a significant segment of Western-built equipment from an earlier era that's still kept in service despite sanctions, and a second set of equipment that in Iran's case was domestically produced, or in Venezuela's case has been imported from Russia. The fighter fleet, for example, is split between roughly 18 F-16s, with the first ones arriving in 1983, and the larger, more capable part of the fleet being made up of 22 Sukhoi-30 MKVs, which arrived from Russia much more recently. The air defense forces, however, have a significant amount of relatively good kit. S-300 and Book are obviously the highlights, but there are estimated to be more than 40 units of the older S-125M, as well as hundreds of old-school, in some cases very old-school, anti-aircraft guns. The majority of those units come from purchases during the Chavez or Maduro years, and reflect that strange pattern we've seen time and time again with the nations that we analyze, Whereas as soon as a country's relationship with the United States tends to sour for whatever reason, one of the first things it tends to do is buy as much air defense as it can get its hands on. Perhaps appropriate when dealing with a potential force for whom global strike is a way of life. And that equipment list is arguably a good segue to start talking about the role Russia has played in Venezuela's modern military development. 
It's a relationship that grew during the Chavez years, but really manifested itself under Maduro. In 2019, after the disputed elections, when many foreign governments withdrew recognition from Maduro's government, and the Venezuelan opposition went so far as to start encouraging the Venezuelan military to throw out Maduro and recognize the authority of the Venezuelan National Assembly, Russia stuck by Maduro and sent a small group, perhaps 100 troops, to Caracas. That wasn't a huge amount of troops, but it was a strong statement of support, especially since Russia acknowledged openly their presence there. It meant there was a small group of troops Maduro might be able to rely on. It meant that anyone trying to overthrow him might be in danger of wounding or killing Russian servicemen in the process. And it signaled to the military and the public that Maduro, not just Guaido, still had friends. Just as in Syria, Russia showed that it didn't have the same resources as, for example, nations like the USA or China, but it absolutely was willing to use them to potentially try and shape the course of international events. In terms of friendship and support between the two countries, there are plenty of ways that nations can choose to express this, with Russia choosing to express its friendship in the form of advanced weapon systems, and the Venezuelan government showing its appreciation in turn with piles and piles of oil money. If you look just at the arms transfers that were captured by CIPRI, Russia shipped Venezuela 92 tanks, 40 transport helicopters, 24 fighters, more than 1,000 surface-to-air missiles, 4,000 man pads, 1,000 ATGMs, 250 air-to-air missiles of various types, and 50 anti-ship missiles. To put that into perspective, in the first couple of months of war in Ukraine, America rushed Ukraine about 1,400 Stinger man pads and then put out a contract to replace them. That was enough to serve a valuable role in the context of a country trying to fight off an invasion by the Russian army. Venezuela received nearly three times that many while choosing to square off against a neighbor that doesn't operate any combat aircraft. Here the question is more about some of the soft factors that help determine how effective a military is and how ready it is to undertake a major operation. Things like equipment readiness, manning levels, and of course, everyone's old favorite, corruption. Because just as in other fields, readiness does matter. No one's going to give their airline 50% marks if they get on board the aircraft and then get told that due to a maintenance issue, it can't actually fly. All militaries face the readiness challenge, and different ones deal with it in different ways. Some just never use their equipment so it doesn't break. The American approach is to throw an obnoxious amount of money at the problem. While the Russians seem to keep so much stuff in reserve that even if a significant part of it is broken, you'll still be able to largely keep up with losses and requirements regardless. When it comes to Venezuela, however, we've got reasons to doubt just how prepared they might be. At least one of the two submarines is widely reported to be non-functional, while putting the other onto protracted and sustained war patrols would arguably be a bit of an ocean gate maneuver. About 4% of the Sukhoi fleet was lost in July, when an aircraft went down in a training exercise preparing for a parade. Readiness amongst the other jets is obviously unknown, but we sure don't seem to see the F-16s flying particularly often. I've already picked on the Navy for losing a ship to ramming by a civilian cruise liner, but readiness and maintenance for the surface fleet is a concern as well. If you look at some of the most modern vessels that Venezuela has, the Avante 2200s from Spain, one of the class, pennant number PC-22, commissioned August 2011, managed to run itself aground during a naval exercise with Brazil in August of 2012. It was made known the ship was going to be sent for repairs, originally in a Brazilian yard, but eventually it was transferred back to Venezuela unrepaired and is still not back in service. When you have a worse ratio of time in service versus time under repair than the Admiral Kuznetsov, there might just be some wider issues with the ability of your navy to maintain and repair its ships. Venezuela does hold military exercises, which are usually one key piece of the readiness puzzle. But on the sliding scale between practical and theatre, they tend to veer very much towards the latter. And then there's another very familiar adversary to military readiness we've discussed before, and that's the ever-present threat of corruption. Now I'll throw the caveat up front here that measuring corruption is obviously hard. But using some of the measures we have available to us, like Transparency International's Corruption Perception Index, There is one area where Venezuela outstrips every other nation we've talked about, whether that be Russia, Ukraine, or Iran. In 2022, Venezuela ranked 177th out of 180 in the world for corruption perception. It was beaten out for the top spot only by Somalia, Syria, and South Sudan, but did manage to land a higher corruption perception score than two countries that had either recently or are still fighting civil wars, Yemen and Libya, as well as the famously normal and transparent country of North Korea. But you know what? There is every possibility that Venezuela won't be denied its spot at the top of the table for long. 
The last time stats were taken, 87% of respondents indicated they thought corruption had gotten worse over the last 12 months, and about half admitted to having personally paid a bribe in the last year. Now, if you're looking for a comparison, Guyana is far from perfect. But they have climbed their way into the top half of the table and now have the same score as India. But in Venezuela, corruption seems to be almost a feature, not a bug, of the political system. And with it comes a giant question mark over all the issues we've discussed in previous episodes. Diversion of resources, faking of readiness reports, corruption in contracts to support the military, and occasionally levels of theft and diversion that just verge on the wacky. About a week ago, for example, the Venezuelan National Guard reported they had raided a bloke's house, and apparently in his backyard they found a training version of the R-73 air-to-air missile used by the Sukhoi 30s that had been stolen from a nearby airbase. Now look, when I was growing up, rebellious young people might steal normal things, like street signs and letterboxes. But look, when you've got to the point where people can start grabbing air-to-air missiles from secure military facilities, you might have just a little bit of a security and corruption problem as a military and society. What sort of impact those issues have on military readiness and capability is hard to be sure of. But if the state of the oil industry is any indication, I personally have my doubts. And issues with corruption, morale, incompetence and diversion seem to go far beyond just one bloke thinking it'd be funny to steal an air-to-air missile. Military equipment reportedly ends up in all sorts of weird, wonderful and unpleasant places. And especially back in 2019, the military faced a wave of resignations and desertions. All of this has led a number of analysts to conclude the Venezuelan military is much weaker now than it once was. The problem from Guyana's perspective is that the Venezuelan military doesn't have to be that big or that good to pose a significant threat to the small nation. Guyana has a small population, volunteer military, and until recently was relatively poor. And so in many ways, the capabilities of the country's defence force reflects those realities. In 2021, the defence budget was roughly 71 million US dollars. And no matter what your local purchasing power multiplier might be, there's only so far you can make 71 million US dollars go in the defence space, unless you're willing to embrace the North Korean model in which payments to troops and the people manufacturing your military equipment are more guidelines as opposed to actual rules. Guyana's army had about 3,000 regular troops, plus some reserve and militia components, the Air Force had no actual combat aircraft, and the Navy is a patrol-only force. Its largest surface unit is a river-class offshore patrol vessel, which has a gun-only armament, no missiles. Now, it's obviously possible that as additional revenues flow into Guyana with the oil boom, that more money will become available for defence. But in the here and now, what the country mostly has is a small force that is relatively lightly armed, configured primarily for border control, law enforcement and disaster relief. One comment I want to add here, however, is that even though Guyana is currently weak in military terms, that doesn't mean that it will stay weak. News of oil revenues hitting your coffers is a great way to secure invitations to arms expos. And as an oil producer, Guyana achieves both new geopolitical significance, while also potentially gaining the resources to significantly reform their capabilities. And so maybe, just maybe I've heard it argued, Maduro's thinking might go, that even if the Venezuelan military has been weakened by corruption, lack of access to foreign technical support, spare parts, and a dozen other factors besides, in Guyana, Maduro has found an opponent who is so weak militarily that even Venezuela's limited strength would be enough to defeat or more likely intimidate them. But only if the issue is raised now, not in a decade. And so if Maduro does decide to escalate things and launch a very special military operation all of his own, what potentially might that look like? Because I think the important point here is this isn't a binary exercise between doing nothing and launching an all-out invasion. A lot depends on what Venezuela chooses to do from a wide array of increasingly special military options available to them, and also what you assume Maduro's underlying objectives to be. If, for example, you believe that this isn't really about Essequibo itself, but rather about bolstering Maduro's position in the lead-up to elections next year, possibly creating an excuse to declare martial law, and perhaps putting some pressure on the United States in negotiations while also avoiding a negative judgment from the ICJ, well, none of that requires an actual invasion. It just requires the appearance of a crisis and a threatened invasion. If you believe the goal is even more significant concessions, say, for example, receiving a cut from the proceeds of any oil collected in the Essequibo region, then that probably requires further pressure and threats again. While if you think the goal is to actually take the territory itself and effectively incorporate it into Venezuela, then you're probably talking about a significant application of military force. 
To illustrate my point here, let's perhaps look at a couple of points along that sliding scale of action and the potential risks, costs, and dubious rewards involved. A relatively sedate option, for example, would be not to start a war or even to come close to starting a war, but rather to simply posture. You pull the geopolitical equivalent of squaring up to your full height, beating your chest, declaring that Essequibo will be part of Venezuela, and then do basically nothing about it. That might mean taking some symbolic actions that we've already seen Venezuela undertake, some of which might even have some practical value. Maybe you construct new supporting and forward positioning infrastructure close to the border. Maybe you position some troops up there for exercises. Or maybe you just hand out a bunch of maps showing the region as part of Venezuela every chance you get. That might not sound like it would accomplish as much, but if you're sitting in Maduro's chair, it might. You might be able to exploit the rally round the flag effect, saying that you are defending Venezuela and its natural rights against the other. The other in this case might be foreign powers, the International Court of Justice, major international oil companies, take your pick. That in turn might be useful if the goal is to rally domestic support or to create a pretext of crisis which might justify further crackdowns on the opposition. After all, the rhetoric might go, if you're the one defending the legitimate interests of the country, then surely anyone who's being critical of you must absolutely be a destabilizing agent of a foreign power who needs to be dealt with accordingly. Meanwhile, you've also dodged a potentially averse ICJ judgment and have an opportunity to find out if any international companies will pay for licenses to operate on your quote-unquote land. But realistically, simply posturing isn't going to do anything to change the reality on the ground in Essequibo. And so if Maduro wants to apply a little more pressure, he might choose to take it up a notch, from merely posturing to taking some symbolic actions. Here, the goal might be to symbolically challenge Guyana's ownership of the territory in a series of ways, but not in a way that actually requires shooting at someone or potentially being shot at in turn. Maybe you go ahead with passing a law which legally, in inverted commas, incorporates the territory into Venezuela, which is something that looks increasingly likely, but you stop short of actually employing any kind of military force, because that runs a risk of escalation that you might not be able to control. The issues that Maduro might run into then, however, include the fact that the likes of ExxonMobil probably aren't going to care that Venezuela legally incorporates the region. As long as they have valid agreements with the government of Guyana, no one is going to stop them setting up their rigs and pumping some oil. Unless, of course, some of that infrastructure or the relevant supply shipments come under threat of some kind, and as a result, corporates face pressures to reconsider their investments, while governments might face incentives to negotiate or otherwise resolve the issue. This would be the domain of some sort of grey zone or harassment strategy. Venezuela already has a range of small, fast naval assets that might be suitable for that sort of role, but there's always the risk of prompting an international reaction, potentially threatening foreign-owned assets, and of course, as far as international law is concerned, acting like a pirate in an area is not a great way to establish sovereignty there. To do that, you want to start acting like you own the place, quite literally. So if you want to dial it up further, one option would be to move into the disputed area, whether that be the offshore exclusive economic zone or the territorial land of Essequibo itself, and just start acting like it's Venezuelan territory. Issue licenses for economic activity, something the Venezuelans are already talking about doing. Issue warnings to or even attempt to go after those who are extracting resources without your permission. For example, oil companies extracting with permits issued by Guyana. While on land, that might look like sending some little green men into the territories of Essequibo and desperately hoping that, as in Crimea in 2014, for the most part, no one shoots back. At this point, you're starting to get pretty close to using military force to physically take your objective. You're injecting military units into the disputed area and saying this is yours now. By taking this step, however, there are a lot of risks that go with it. Because at this point, especially if we send troops into another country's territory, you are very explicitly crossing the war peace threshold, at which point you're taking two significant gambles. Firstly, that no other nation is going to choose this point to intervene. That's particularly relevant if you're talking about the Venezuelan Navy trying to exercise its jurisdiction in what is currently Guyana's EEZ, because all it would really take to ruin the plan there was the intervention by a country with a more powerful navy than Venezuela, which based on the current state of the force is a very long list which probably doesn't actually include any civilian cruise ship companies, but I imagine the threat can't be entirely discounted. The other issue is at this point, you're stuck unless Guyana chooses to concede. Because unless they do, you might not have a path towards de-escalation and a return to business as normal. And until you get that return to business as usual, you're potentially stuck with your army on occupation duty in the bloody Amazon, 
and the political and economic challenge of trying to sustain a major military operation when your starting point prior to the operation was deep domestic unpopularity and an economy that was going through triple-digit inflation. In other words, you only win if the other side agrees that you win, or you find a way to force them to do so. Now, at this point, you might be asking, hey, Perun, if Venezuela just needs to force Guyana to concede, what's stopping them from just launching the most special of all special military operations? And given Guyana's relatively limited military strength, heading straight for the capital of Georgetown. And the answer, I think, is a lot, starting with the bloody Amazon rainforest. The current border between Venezuela and Guyana is basically dominated by the Amazon rainforest. Infrastructure on both sides of the border is incredibly limited, and there are no major roads crossing it. You might see settlements on that satellite map there, but that doesn't give you a sense of the scale of many of those settlements. The town of Maburuma there, for example, visible close to the Venezuelan border, had a 2012 census population of about 1,300 people, large enough to be the objective of a major Russian offensive, but too small, practically speaking, to be a major logistical hub. Suffice to say that an overland push by the Venezuelan military would be an incredibly complicated logistical exercise. Just concentrating sufficient forces and sustaining them on the Venezuelan side of the border would be difficult enough. Many of the best logistical links run through Brazilian territory to the south, and military access there seems unlikely, while other options, like launching a small marine landing against Guyana's capital, is the kind of operation you might class as hypothetically possible. But in operational terms, it probably has a risk profile similar to walking around Delhi in a Pakistani cricket t-shirt and a sign saying Virat Kohli is overrated. And all of this assumes, of course, that Guyana is alone. The reality, however, is that conflict doesn't have to be a two-player game, and any confrontation between Venezuela and Guyana doesn't occur in a vacuum. The world is a globalised place, the great powers are watching, and so any plan that Maduro makes has to take account of how the world might respond to it. And spoiler alert, with the possible exception of a few nations like Russia, most are probably happy with the world only dealing with a single special military operation at a time. Now, because the list of all countries that care about how this crisis plays out includes all countries that care about the price of oil and or international law, here I think there's some reason to start zoomed out rather than looking at individual countries. If you zoom out far enough, you can argue there is a broader clash of interests going on here. One that may be, to some extent, separate from questions of protecting the existing international order or international law or the strategic balance between states. Instead, it's the clash of interests between countries who would like to see oil prices high, think OPEC nations like Russia, and the countries that would like oil prices to be low. Unlike OPEC, these countries don't normally get an acronym, so for now I'd suggest calling them the big oil importing or consuming states, the boys or the box. The boys have economies and populations who very much feel the impact of rising and falling oil prices. That underlying motivation brings together a lot of countries that you wouldn't normally consider major geopolitical allies. India, China, and the European Union, for example, are all massive oil consumers who benefit from low prices. And even though the United States is a massive oil producer, it's also a tremendous consumer, to the point where I'm pretty sure that if you took a rock, painted it red, white, and blue, and entered it into a US presidential election, running on a platform that guaranteed the rock would bring gas prices down to 10 cents a gallon, I reckon there's a chance we'd see the first inanimate object reigning in the Oval Office. A major recent trend in the oil market has been for OPEC states, like Russia and Saudi Arabia, to announce production cuts in an effort to bring up prices. At the same time, the boys have an interest in bringing as much non-OPEC production onto the market as possible. That, for example, has included a lot of production out of the United States, potential agreement with some OPEC countries, like Venezuela, in order to try and increase their oil production, and of course, efforts in countries like Guyana that are not OPEC members and might be able to bring potentially hundreds of thousands of additional barrels per day to the global market, helping to hold down global prices. And if you're looking at the who's who of investment in Guyana's oil fields, ExxonMobil is probably currently the king of the hill, but when Guyana put 14 offshore oil and gas exploration blocks up for auction in September, basically getting firms to bid for the right to explore for oil and gas in particular areas, Guyana's Ministry of Natural Resources reportedly referred to two separate consortia making bids, one made up of Malaysian, Qatari, and French firms, and the US-Chinese consortium we discussed earlier. Both the American and Chinese firms have an established presence and interest in Guyana's oil production, and the consortium was already producing almost 400,000 barrels of oil per day in September of this year. It's arguably in the waters off Essequibo, where both have a keen interest in making sure that the oil does flow which means that in challenging the status quo in Essequibo, Maduro is potentially threatening not just Guyana, 
but American and Chinese interests, both in Guyana and potentially Venezuela. That arguably gives the US a strategic imperative to avoid a significant disruption of the status quo. And indeed, for some American strategists, coming to the defense of a small oil-producing country being attacked by a larger neighbor might be the kind of 1990s flashback that they can get behind. Politically and strategically, of course, the US here is being pulled in multiple directions at the same time. The agreement with sanctions relief for Venezuela was with a view to getting democratic elections in that country and also getting more Venezuelan oil onto the market. At the same time, US relations with Guyana are increasingly important, and so far at least, the US is standing by the sovereignty and territorial integrity of that smaller state. Earlier this week, the White House national security spokesperson, John Kirby, told reporters that, quote, we absolutely stand by our unwavering support for Guyana's sovereignty, end quote, and that Washington supported a peaceful resolution to the border dispute between Venezuela and Guyana. What Washington hasn't yet said is how the country would respond if Venezuela chose to take military action against Guyana or against key American strategic interests in the region, also known as ExxonMobil's offshore oil infrastructure. On the 7th of December, it was reported the US had chosen to go ahead with a small pre-scheduled military exercise with Guyana, but we haven't seen any public large-scale movement of US forces into the region, and realistically, any Venezuelan escalation to the military level would rely on that continuing to be the case. Beijing has arguably found its position complicated by the escalation. China has described both Venezuela and Guyana as good friends, and the country is a major creditor to Venezuela and potential investor in Guyana. And so its position so far has been that its good friends should resolve their border issues, while stressing that, quote, China has always respected the sovereignty and territorial integrity of all countries, end quote. Not stated there is how that respect for territorial integrity and sovereignty applies when two of your allies are disputing each other's borders, leaving China having to juggle its relationship with both countries, even as relationships between them continue to deteriorate. It's also worth mentioning Brazil, who have long had good relationships with Guyana, and since the most recent presidential election, has been improving its relationship with Venezuela as well. Brazil is very much a nation in the middle of this evolving situation. Perhaps unsurprisingly, Brazil has already rushed additional troops to its northern border, while the government has openly called for calm, saying, quote, we don't want a war in South America, end quote. Brazil's positioning so far is very much as a potential mediator. But in a regional context, its military and economic power shouldn't be written off. The army and navy are larger and better equipped than the Venezuelan equivalent, although the air force is still very much going through a modernization process. However, those points around hard power, for the moment at least, seem very secondary. Brazil, publicly speaking, is keenly focused on its role as a mediator, and the Brazilian constitution imposes significant limitations on the ability of the country to use military force. In summary, if you look at some of the most relevant and powerful international players, outside of perhaps Russia, Venezuela isn't exactly drowning in allies that would be keen for it to escalate. By contrast, most of the major players seem to support the continuation of the status quo, or in the case of the United States, have gone so far as to actively endorse and support what they regard as Guyana's sovereignty and territorial integrity. There is a strong strategic desire to get Venezuelan oil flowing and elections happening, but the argument for supporting a small democracy with the capacity to produce a significant amount of oil may well resonate in the halls of power. Which brings us to a closing evaluation of Maduro's chances if he decides to escalate the issue and take direct military action against Guyana. And whereas normally I would like to hedge my bets to a certain extent, here I think there are several factors we've looked at by now that all point in the same direction. Namely, that if Maduro decided to take a page out of the Vladimir Putin playbook and send in the troops, it would be a political and military manoeuvre only slightly less risky than trying to run the marathon through a minefield. Problem one is simply that even if everything else goes right, the whole operation might be beyond the limited capacity of the Venezuelan military. Even if Guyana's defensive capabilities are very limited, Essequibo itself is huge, full of relatively unhospitable terrain, while the Venezuelan navy isn't exactly drowning in modern platforms to exercise control over the valuable offshore oil fields. So gamble number one is that the Venezuelan military can actually achieve what it seeks to achieve in the territory and take and hold what it needs to take and hold long enough to secure a decisive result. All the while, gamble two will be playing out the bet that no one will intervene to stop this. If any major regional or global power decides to intervene in favour of Guyana, that's probably it, game over. At sea, most of the Venezuelan navy would be incredibly vulnerable. Venezuelan forces on the ground would be at the end of very long and extended supply lines. 
and the country of Venezuela itself is incredibly reliant on continued maritime traffic. If Venezuelan oil doesn't go out and critical imports don't come in, then it's likely the already fragile Venezuelan economy would feel the pressure quickly. The key here is basically that Venezuela isn't Russia. Russia was a nuclear armed state that enjoyed nuclear armed deterrence. Russia was a country with truly massive foreign exchange reserves, relatively limited debt, and an economy that had been built up for many years leading up to the war in Ukraine in order to better withstand Western sanctions. Venezuela has no nuclear weapons, triple digit inflation, and very limited government financial resources. So if your whole bet is that the Americans will turn down the opportunity to fight a quick, likely victorious defensive war in their own neighborhood against a self-declared socialist state in an environment where oil is on the table, it is hypothetically possible that you win that bet, but it does feel a little bit like remortgaging the house, heading to a roulette table and betting the whole thing on 16. And even if no military intervention was forthcoming, the question that would naturally follow is, what's the end game? And would any of this put Venezuela or Maduro in a better position than when they started? I've already discussed the ways in which posturing or symbolism might have legitimate payoffs for Maduro. There is a chance he can raise tension levels just enough to get the domestic payoff and cover that he needs, while at the same time not sparking outside intervention or the reimposition of sanctions. But if things escalate to the point of military force and an occupation of some or all of Essequibo takes place, it's a different story. It's hard to imagine American investment and sanctions relief continuing to flow after that sort of development, and so the future of the potential renaissance in Venezuela's domestic oil sector would be thrown into question. At the same time, there's no guarantee they'd be able to easily generate profit from their newly held territories. Venezuelan troops occupying the jungle don't really change much in the offshore oil and gas fields unless countries and corporations begin to recognize that occupation. If the US, China, and the relevant oil companies continue to recognize the right of Guyana to issue permits for those offshore areas, then the only way for Venezuela to definitively stop that kind of activity would be to go after the oil infrastructure itself. And if you're trying to avoid an intervention and keep up friendships, then attacking offshore oil infrastructure owned by American, Chinese, French, or Malaysian companies is probably not a great start. Make no mistake, the entire exercise could be a massive catastrophe for Guyana. But it's also hard to understand how the entire activity is meant to turn out to be a net win for Venezuela, unless you assume the entire rest of the world and Guyana itself is going to turn around, nod their heads, say fair play, and agree to give Venezuela the W. And while I am not, and will never claim to be, a military planner, from a military history perspective, assuming that all of your opponents will do exactly what you would like them to do is the kind of unfortunately common and incredibly stupid assumption that has led to many a campaign or quick victorious war turning out to be anything but. By that assessment, the most likely outcome is that Venezuela doesn't invade Guyana. Instead, they publish statements and plans on the integration of the region into Venezuela, potentially pressure companies to pay royalties or buy licenses from the Venezuelan government in relation to the territory even while it is not under effective Venezuelan military control, and push Guyana to re-enter talks over the region without taking the step of using military force to force Guyana to actually make any serious concessions. A win for Maduro in this sense might mean appearing strong on the domestic front, while also potentially encouraging international oil firms to throw them a couple of dollars in exchange for guaranteed peace and quiet no matter how the dispute plays out. It remains to be seen how those big consortia would respond to that sort of request, but it does seem to be the outcome most consistent with the plans and statements made by Maduro so far. That certainly seems to be what international oil markets are expecting, with the price of oil continuing to trend down at time of recording, which is not what you would expect to happen if two oil-producing countries were actually on the cusp of going to war with one another. Right now, much of the world seems to expect that Maduro will stick to posturing and symbolism, because arguably, actually invading would be a monumentally stupid thing to do. But before anyone gets too complacent, let me bring up a lesson that all of us are probably very familiar with. Namely, that just because something is stupid, doesn't mean someone won't try it anyway. And when an unpopular leader is looking for a quick fix to a difficult economic or domestic situation, it sometimes doesn't take much for stupid to become the game plan, with tragic consequences for all involved. Those consequences can range from the geopolitical to the very personal. And I've already heard stories of people in Essequibo wondering whether they need to leave their homes and relocate somewhere like Georgetown until the situation becomes clearer. When we use terms like geopolitical tensions, it's important not to forget that those sort of stories exist, and that when states manoeuvre or clash, no matter whoever is in the right or the wrong, 
The consequences are often most acutely borne by the people in the middle of it. In conclusion, there's plenty of reasons to believe that Maduro's decision to escalate the centuries-long dispute over Essequibo has as much to do with domestic political concerns as it does with geopolitical ones. With international oil companies active in the region and various governments calling either for calm and the preservation of the status quo or actively endorsing Guyana's sovereignty and territorial integrity as it currently stands, any Venezuelan attempt to seize the territory by force is likely to be incredibly risky, essentially gambling that no interested major power would make the decision to step in. But that doesn't mean the crisis is over. Indeed, it may only be getting started. And in play is the future of the Venezuelan people and economy, the stability of South America, and also the ongoing meteoric rise of Guyana's economy, which is transforming what used to be a heavily indebted poor country into an ever more prosperous one month by month, year by year. Only time will tell if the situation escalates further, or if cooler heads and implied deterrence ultimately prevail. Okay, very brief channel update to close out, because as I said in the introduction, uh, I do have COVID at the moment and recording is difficult. So please, if there are any issues in delivery or precision this week, please be a little more forgiving than normal. I do, however, feel a little less horrible today than I have in several days, so hopefully things are heading in the right direction. This topic was voted for by all of you, so I hope you're very happy with the result. I would also like to extend my personal and very sincere thanks to those of you from both Venezuela and Guyana who reached out in advance of this episode being recorded to offer your perspectives, thoughts, and valuable information and sources. I hope that all of you remain both safe and well. I'll save most other updates for next week, but for the moment I will note that I have somewhat revived the Perun Gaming channel as I try and recover, so if you are interested, please do jump over and check it out. Thank you so much to all of you as always, and I'll see you all again next week.